please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 4, continuing our study through the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 4, and when you get there, starting at verse number 1, the Bible reads, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us, lest uh, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as, un as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into, the, into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, the, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Brother Jeff, would you pray for us? Right. Amen. Well, we're back in the, the book of Hebrews again. Had a good week off with some guest preaching, which was a blessing. I'm sure that you all feel the same way. Um, so if you remember um, the theme going through the book of Hebrews, right? We started off talking about, obviously, this is written to Hebrew Christians, those who came out of the old Hebrew religion, right? Out of the old covenant into the new one. And you can tell by reading through this, and even just studying the, the other books and the epistles in the New Testament, that the Judaizers would go into churches and try to stir up people. They would try to tell them things like you have to get circumcised. You know, yeah, this is great, you believe in Jesus, but you still got to keep the law. You still have to do this. You have to maintain. They would do anything they could to somehow sow in works for salvation, even to people that were already saved, already believed. You know, these Hebrews, they would go into these places, or these Jews would go into these places and say, well, if we can't necessarily, you know, convert them because they've already been converted, well, let's at least get them back to the old way. Let's at least get some kind of works involved some way, shape, or form. And the writer of Hebrews spends this entire time telling us that everything about our profession is better than the old way of doing business, okay? For example, the mediating priesthood, you know, of the Old Testament. Why would you want to go from being a king and a priest today, having that direct access to God, back to that old system? Why would you want to go and drive, you know, who knows, however many miles or travel however many miles to go to a temple or to go somewhere to bring an offering or a sacrifice when you can go to your local, hopefully, New Testament Bible-believing church today, you know, or have open up the Word of God and have access to truth right at your own fingertips, right? We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We don't need a mediating priesthood. All those things were a shadow of things to come. And the point is the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And the writer here, he's who I believe is Paul, but he's telling these people, hey, everything about what we've got going on here is better. Okay, Jesus is better than Moses, better than the angels, because what these Jews would do is they'd go in there and start lifting up Moses and trying to pit Moses against Jesus. And, oh, you're saying that Moses isn't anything. He's not special. He wasn't a popular. This is what you guys are saying. You're, you're teaching people to go against Moses. And the writer here is saying that's no, simply absolutely not true, because when we see Moses appear during the time of Christ, right, with Elijah, what do we learn? 
He, what would Moses tell you today? He would say, hey, do whatever he says. What did Jesus' own mother say to people? Hey, do whatever he says. Whatever he says, just do it, okay? Obviously denoting the superiority of Christ, and that is the point of this book, the superiority of Christ, our faith, everything about the Word of God being superior to all these diverse washings and carnal ordinances and things that the Hebrews had to go through. And Paul's reminding these people, hey, why would you want to go back to that system? And then, of course, as you're reading through Hebrews, there are a list of severe warnings to believers, to those that are saved. And we've started looking at some of those. We'll get back to that in the next uh, couple of chapters. Uh, but if you remember from two weeks ago, we were in chapter number three. We did look at some warnings in there. We looked at a lot of different things. The writer here, he's telling us, hey, look, you know, you guys need to think back to the provocation. Think back. You've been taught the stories. You know what happened when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Some people didn't enter into the promised land. They did not go into rest. Why is that? Well, it's because of their unbelief, because of their dissatisfaction. And that's going to be important to understand as we begin reading verse number 1 in chapter 4. But just for a quick review, let's go back to chapter 3 and look at verse number 15. And look at what it says there. Uh, so Hebrews 3.15 says, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Okay, So that whole ordeal where the children of Israel were like, hey, we want the onions, we want the garlic, we want to go back to the leeks where we had security back in Egypt. Okay, This whole not knowing where our next drink or next meal is coming from is really getting old. right? And it's like day two, day three out of you know leaving Egypt. These guys are already murmuring, already complaining. And God's not happy with that. Okay, And the reason why this is being brought up okay, is not just a message to those who would reject the gospel, but a message to those who would reject the wisdom that comes out of the word of God after salvation okay and that really honestly sums up most people that are saved today think about this are most people that are saved in the world are they in church are they disciples are they working to better themselves are they working to better their character or their personality absolutely not okay that's just a it's sad but that's reality and God's not pleased with that sort of behavior so look at verse 16 he says for some when they had heard did provoke Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So again, when you're reading through the Old Testament, we've talked about this before, Egypt is often likened unto the world. And Moses is a type of Christ. So you're kind of seeing how that works here. It's symbolic in, in, in a certain way where we can kind of see how Christ rec rescues us out of the world. It's like, why would we want to go back to the world, right? It's the same message to us. So people are like, well, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it's just for the Hebrews or just for those who are going to get saved in, in Israel today. That's really what it applies to. And they're going to go back to doing the offerings and the sacrifices. It's like, you, uh, you're absolutely absolutely stupid. You don't know anything about the Bible if that's your attitude. That's not what it's talking about at all. Yes, it's geared towards those who came out of the Judaic religion, right? And Paul's saying, hey, those things had their time, they had their place, they had their season, but what we have now, the revelation that we have now is absolutely better. Well, this applies to believers today because we've been led out of Egypt by Christ, right? We've been led out of the world. And so the message for us, the application for us is why do you want to go back? Why do you want to go back into bondage and, and working and looking for the glory of the world and trying to please everyone and trying to make friends with people that don't believe like you? It doesn't work. It's a recipe for absolute disaster and God is not pleased with it. So let's keep reading here. Look at verse 17. He says, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? And that's a great question. Whom was he grieved? Why do we need to understand who God was grieved by? Okay, let me ask you this. Is it possible for a believer to grieve the Holy Ghost? Absolutely. Absolutely. But yet today we have a bunch of people who honestly don't think that that's possible. They say, oh, well, if you're really saved, you would never do anything like that. You would never grieve the Holy Spirit. You would never quench the Spirit. You would follow the law of God perfectly. Er, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. And that is the point being brought up here. So one more time, he says this, verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? And then he answers the question. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So we're supposed to go back and read those things and study those things and reflect on those things and realize, you know what? God's not happy with everyone all the time, no matter what decision they make. 
That's the message of new evangelical Christianity today. That's the message uh, that the world wants to push today, right? God's not mad at you. I think it's Joyce Myers, if I'm not mistaken, who has a book that says God's not mad at you. Really? Because I think God's mad at a lot of people today, okay? If he's not, why are these things in the Bible? Verse 18, it says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I like that song that we sang, you know, the third song, you know, the haven of rest, right? That's, I, I think that's very applicable. You know, I anchor my soul into the haven of rest, right? That's, that's, that's a, a great doctrinal song that we should all have on our hearts, that we should all uh, be grateful that we're even healthy enough or able enough to come in here and to sing that in the presence of God. You know, we ought to be a group of people, and I really think that we are, but we need to make sure that we maintain this, 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 uh, this, this attitude here that it's a privilege to be able to serve God. You know, it's a privilege to be able to have God give you truth in the Bible as a Christian because not everyone goes down that road. Think about that. There are people who come in here and they get excited. They get worked up. They're saved. You know, they do a little bit of works for God, but then all of a sudden they go back to Egypt. They failed to heed the warning. They haven't anchored their souls in the rest. And I'm not saying they aren't saved. Of course they're saved. That's without a doubt. But just because you're saved doesn't necessarily mean that you are living the Christian life of rest that God wants you to have. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not preaching prosperity to you today, right? What I'm saying is even going through trials and tribulations, you can still find rest when your soul, your heart, your mind is anchored to the promises in this book. How else was Paul able to get up after being stoned and beaten and say, hey, where's the next city? I've got plenty more invites, right? There's more doors to be knocked. You know, there's plenty of people to talk to. Don't let these bruises, don't let these welts, don't let this swelling get to you. Let's go. I can talk and I can walk. And that's all I need, right, to preach the gospel. So again, verse 19 of chapter 3, he says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, if you were to go back and do an audit of everybody who walked on dry ground, right, and, and say, okay, who here actually went to heaven versus who went to hell? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. But here's the thing. I believe that there were definitely people that were saved who murmured and who complained, who died and went to heaven. God said, you know what? If you're not going to change your attitude, you're not going to heed to my word. You're not going to trust me. I'm not going to be able to build this nation with those types of people because they are toxic. Okay. Think about this. We ought not to get this attitude also. You know, oh, well, those who didn't enter into the promised land weren't saved because guess what? Their leader didn't enter into the promised land. Are you going to say Moses wasn't saved? <laughs> That's absurd to even think something like that. So just something to keep in mind there. So now let's, with that uh, uh, understanding, let's look at verse number one of chapter four. So he says this, let us therefore fear. Let's stop right there. Let us therefore fear. Okay. Now, the fear of man, we've talked about this numerous times. What does that bring? A snare, a trap. It brings terror. It brings fright. It brings bondage. That is the type of fear that you will get when you get caught up into the course of the world and you're trying to please the world. You're trying to please the man. That's the type of fear you're going to get. What we're supposed to do is have a healthy fear of God. And yes, you should fear God. Now, some people would say, oh, you're just teaching people to be paranoid. Well, that's not what I'm teaching at all. I'm teaching you to fear the word of God. You say, why? Because that's what's written down here. We're supposed to look back at these stories here and consider the people who God said, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm going to take you home. I'm going to kill you, whatever it is, and look at those people and say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to be like that in any way, shape, or form, right? Therefore, so he says this, verse one, let us therefore fear we are called to be a people that fear God. And as believers, don't ever, ever, ever get this attitude that, oh, well, I'm saved. God's never going to chasten me. God is never going to be that bad. He's never going to do X, Y, and Z. I, mean, I can do whatever I want because I'm a child of the king. Now, look, think about the world. Does that even really work out for these super mega rich kids in the world? They still pay the price, don't they? They still get exposed. They still get caught. I mean, think about Hunter Biden. Now, is he deserving the justice that God's going to give him? Not yet. 
right? Because old uh, Papa Biden, you know, is in office and pulling strings and trying to get him off the hook. The media's got Hunter Biden's back. But here's the thing. The guy's acting a fool. I mean, the guy's a cokehead, probably a pedophile, all sorts of wicked and horrible things that this guy is, right? But think about this. He's definitely a shame to his mother and his father, right? Now, Looking at the world, I mean, that's just one example of many. I mean, take a look, you talk about the Hilton twins, you could talk about, I mean, the, the Rothschilds, these Rockefellers, these people are always in trouble. Their kids are always out of control. You say, why? Because they're spoiled. They've grown up with a gold spoon in their mouths, and they think that they're owed everything. But sooner or later, God's laws catches up with them, and they do get into trouble, and they do bring shame on their families. And you know what? The whole reason that happens is because they don't fear. They don't fear anything. They don't fear consequence. They don't fear trouble. They don't fear the law. They don't fear anything. But you know what? There are believers who act the same way, and it's a shame, and it's despicable, and ought, it ought not to be so. So he says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you, don't miss these next two words, should seem to come short of it. Some people will point to these verses and I'll say, see, lost your salvation right there. I'll say, see, if you don't fear God, guess what? You don't enter into his rest. And guess what? You could be saved and start living in the world and then, bam, you don't get any rest anymore. Well, that's not what he's saying. He says, he says after the comma there, after rest, what does it say? Any of you should seem to come short of it. I could name for you plenty of believers, plenty of people who are saved, who seem like they are not at rest right now. I saw one the other day at the gas station off of Fairview, okay? <laughs> All right? I'm just, I mean, I'm serious. You see these people and are just like, my life's a nightmare. Everything's going to hell. What's going on? Or worse, they lie and say, oh, everything's going great. I've been blessed more than I ever have. And you know that's a lie. It's not true. And even if it is for a season, guess what? God will catch up with you, and he's going to do something to you. It's going to happen. God didn't spare the people who came out of Egypt, who mocked, ridiculed, and murmured. He's not going to do, he's not going to spare us who are saved today. It's the same thing. But the writer here, he says, any of you should seem to come short of it. So we don't want to get to a place in the Christian life to where it seems to us or it seems to other people like we're not at peace, like we're not at rest, because that's a bad testimony. You see what I'm saying? When we're just living in constant fear, like, oh, no, what's going to happen? You know, everything's going. It's like, look, you don't seem to be the type of person who's at rest. Right? Again, go back to the apostles. Go back to the prophets in the Old Testament. When they were being hunted down, when they were being beaten, all these bad things were happening to them. What was their response every single time? He comes first every single time. I'm happy. I've got my God. I'm good to go. What's the mission? What are we going to do? Right? Those are people who have entered rest. You would never look at those people and say, you know, it seems like you're just at, you know, just kind of at odds. Like you're just not resting. No, you wouldn't say that to them at all. No matter what trial or tribulation came their way, they were at rest. But when you flip that around and you get the believer who's out of God's will, who's just not reading, not studying, who's just going back to Egypt and seeking those leeks and the onions and the garlic, which does sound good <laughs> over time. But when you get those types of people and they just want to go back to Egypt, guess what? They're no longer... Uh, seeming to be in rest of the Christian life uh, from a discipleship perspective. So let's move on here. Verse 2. So he says this, For unto us was the gospel preached. Okay? Initial context here. For unto us. Remember, his audience are the people who are coming out of the Old Testament religion of Judaism. And he's saying, hey, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Okay? But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, if you would go to Romans chapter 12, then we're going to go back to Romans chapter 10, and we'll kind of get an idea of what Paul is talking about here. So, what did he just tell us here? Well, he says, hey, the gospel has been preached to us. It was preached to them, those who rejected it, preached to the Gentiles, preached to the whole world. Okay? And what he's saying here is, hey, the word of God is not profitable to certain people. And who would those certain people be? Well, people who hear the word of God, but they don't mix it with faith. Remember, God has given every man something. I talked about that this morning. We're going to read that here in this verse. And that something has to be mixed with the word of God. Let's look at it here. Romans 12, look at verse 3. 
Paul says this, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has given every man a measure of faith, right? We are saved by grace through faith. So the idea here is you go up to somebody who is not saved, you preach them the word of God, they take that measure of faith and they place it on Jesus Christ. They make Jesus Christ the object of their faith, okay? And then they get saved. And the idea after this, and you're going to see as we go through the book of Hebrews, that you continue that process, okay? The Old Testament saints coming out of Egypt, some of them neglected to do this. Moses would say, hey, our God has delivered us. He's going to give us drink. He's going to give us food. He's going to give us shelter. He's going to give us a nation. He's going to give us a law. He's going to give us all these things. And some people were like, I don't believe it. I don't get it, okay? Like, I just, I just don't see it. I just want some water, right? I need some electrolytes. I need, you know, whatever it is, I need something, and I need it now. Okay? Those people were not mixing that message with faith. So what I'm saying is if you're saved, obviously you've got faith. right? You need to read the Word of God and mix it with belief. When you're going through trials and tribulations and all sorts of trouble, you know what? And you hear a promise from the Word of God, you need to not be like the children of Israel who were in unbelief. You need to mix your faith with the Word of God and push that old man aside and say, you know what? God said it. I believe it. End of story. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, look at verse number 17. The Bible says this. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Most people don't believe that. They think, well... If someone's going to get saved, they're just going to come to the knowledge of the Savior. They're just going to look outside one day and realize that there's an order to the universe. Then they're going to call upon God in any way they think that they can, however they know how. right? Whether they're in India and they call upon the Hindu God, whether they're in Saudi Arabia and they call upon Allah, but somehow they're going to call upon the Creator that they know, and they're going to get saved, and they're going to be with us in heaven one day. Who said that? Billy Graham, that's right. Billy Balaam said that. That's false doctrine. No word of God, no salvation. The only way to be saved, the only way to profit as a Christian in, in any capacity is you have to take your faith and mix it with the word of God. That is why God gave you that measure of faith to be placed on the word of God. But what the devil does is he comes along and says, ah, I understand this, and most people don't. And he starts setting up different traps. Oh, here's an NIV. Why don't you mix your faith with that? Here's an ESV. Why don't you mix your faith with that? Here's a great logical explanation of the order of the universe. Why don't you mix your faith with that? Hey, here are all these great works and these great attributes and these great things. Why don't you mix your faith with that? Whereas the Bible says, no, no, no. You need to mix your faith with the Word of God. You need to place your faith on Christ for your salvation. Now, let's back up for a second and look at verse number one. We're going to go through uh, quite a bit of this. We're not going to do a a detailed verse by verse through Romans 10, but we're going to go through a, quite a bit of it because it directly applies to what we're talking about in Hebrews chapter number four, right? We're talking about the word of God being profitable to people that mix it with faith. So uh, Romans 10, look at verse number one. So Paul says this, he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved, right? Paul's not saying, hey, you know, a Jew is somebody who believes in and God and somebody who's circumcised in the heart, we get that, we understand that. And he's not saying that God's just completely thrown every Jew's chance to ever get saved away. Like all Jews, from now on, I was the last one, no one else could get saved. He's not saying that. He's saying, hey, I still have a desire. I still have a love for those people. I grew up with them. I was taught by them. I served with them. I want them to be saved. And look, everybody in here can relate to that. You have family members, you have coworkers, you have friends, you have neighbors, you have people that you want to be saved. And your desire is that they would place that measure of faith that God gave them on Christ. It's the same thing that Paul's talking about. Verse 2, he says this, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And that, that is just such a shame and, and such a, a, a truth. There are a lot of people out there that have great talents, and they have gifts. They have gifts to teach, to speak, to exhort, to do all different things. It would be a huge blessing in the kingdom of God if we could just get them saved and get them that right zeal, right? You got, in order to have the right zeal, you have to have that knowledge that comes from above. You have to have the Word of God. You have to be in the state of mind that says, you know what? The Word of God says it. I believe it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to apply these things. Verse 3, 
He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. And this is the battle that we fight today. This is the message of the world's religion, right? The world has their own religion. They have their own righteousness. You do a certain amount of works, and guess what? You're probably okay. You're probably going to get into your heaven, whatever that may be. That was the attitude, by and large, of Old Testament Israel. Verse 4 says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And again, he's not saying that the law doesn't have its place. Of course it has its place. Of course we gain wisdom from the law. We draw the line with the law. We preach the law. We, you know, all these different things. We like to study it, but that doesn't get you saved. Following the law never got anyone saved. It didn't get anyone saved in the Old Testament, and it certainly won't get anyone saved today. Verse number six, it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. Look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So Paul's saying, hey, look, everybody has the law of God written on their heart. If they really want to be saved, if they really want to call upon God, God will find a way to give them a messenger. I believe that. I believe that he will find a way to do that. You see that in Acts chapter 8 with the, the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, right? He's reading the word of God. He has a desire to be saved. What does God do? He sends Philip to him to preach him the gospel. See the same thing, what is it, Acts uh, chapter 10, right, with Cornelius has a desire to be saved. He's praying. He's trying to do the right thing. God says, hey, I want you to go meet a man named Peter, and he will show the words whereby thou must be saved in thy house, and <coughs> talks about those things. But he says, but what saith the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So he's also letting us know, hey, we preach the word of God. People say, oh, the soul winning thing that you guys do, that's a new phenomenon. Nobody used to do that. Nobody ever does that. That's something new that you guys came up with so that you could control people and you could just get them to do a bunch of things. Look, if I wanted to control people and get them to do a bunch of things, I'd go follow the new evangelical model because it's a whole lot easier. You only have to preach one sermon a week, you know, and it's 20 minutes long and you can bring in a rock band and you don't have to ever say anything offensive. Okay, that's a great way to control people. Sensationalism, that's the way you control people, not by doing the way we do it. Look at verse 9, he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So again, Paul's saying, hey, guess what? This is basically the message that we preach here. We preach salvation by grace through faith. And he's, he's reminding the Romans here, hey, this is what we preach to you. This is what we preach to the Jews. This is what we preach to everyone. And we hope that they will mix it with faith. Verse 10, he says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you remember what Jesus said to the, to the disciples and to the people that were in the area at that time? He said, hey, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not getting into heaven, right? And their righteousness was garbage. But they had a lot of seemingly good works, didn't they? They wore the nice clothing. They had the robes. They had all this, all this pomp and all this glory and stuff. And Jesus makes that statement. He says, hey, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you ain't getting in. And people were probably like, oh, man, these guys are pretty good. They know a lot of Bible. They know a lot of stuff. And, man, they're pretty high up. And Jesus is probably just shaking his head. It's so easy. All you have to do is put your faith and trust on me, and you get to heaven. You get that righteousness imputed unto you. It's given to you. And in an instant, you're automatically exceeding these self-righteous human achievers in the world. Verse 11, for the Scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay? And that's key there. Verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call on Him. So again, I've heard it preached in my life several times. That you know what? We're going to get to heaven and we're going to serve the Jew. We are going to help them with their offerings. We're going to help them with their washings. All of those ordinances are coming back and you'll have the privilege to be their servant. I am not making this up. I mean, this, I have heard this over and over and over again. If you don't believe me, just go on the internet. It's not hard to find. You come see me later, and I'll show you some sermons that have people teaching that type of stuff. Okay? False doctrine. In Christ, there is neither Jew, meaning the religious Jew, or Gentile. Okay? 
because what, what, does he, what does man like to do? Pit people against each other. Every single time, that's what they do. Paul's like, hey, in Christ, that is foolishness. That doesn't work. We don't subscribe to that. Verse 13, he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the question is, do you have to call upon the name of the Lord? Yeah, exactly. If anyone tells you that you don't, what does that mean? Well, that means that they've taken their industrial sharpie and crossed this verse out of the Bible. I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but that's what they mean. They're liars. They are lying to you. You have to, well, what about people who can't speak? Can they still call upon the Lord? Of course, okay? The idea is you're, you're, you're going to desire to be saved. You're going to ask him in the way that you can. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? These things are all key. You have to have a place that trains people up, that sends out preachers, okay? They have to find people, preach the word of God, and people have to believe. They have to take that faith that God has given them and mix it with the word of God. That's the point in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 4. I'll see real quickly, 15. He says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Right, the, the message in the last part of Hebrews 3 and in the beginning part of Hebrews 4 is what? It's entering into his rest. Obviously, when you get saved, you're in his rest. But the question is, are you living like it? Are you using the wisdom of the Bible to actually put you and your family at rest in a world going to hell in a handbasket? That's the idea, and that's the question here, right? We preach the message of glad tidings and good things. The world preaches the message of probation. Hey, you are on a trial, a period of good behavior, and as long as you meet this criteria, at the end of that trial, we will let you have your freedom, okay? But for the new evangelical and the world's religion, that day doesn't come till you die. So what happens is you go around and you knock on someone's door, or you ask somebody, hey, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven or however you put it? And they say, I don't think anybody could know that. And someone told Brother Jeff that today. Someone tells us that every single week. Well, no one can know that. Well, I, what do you mean? Here's, look, look, if someone tells you that, you know, not saved, not saved. They don't know about God's rest. They don't know what glad tidings are. They don't understand any of this stuff, which means they're not saved. So don't be that guy or that gal running around. Well, I think they might be saved. I remember soul winning with, in these apartments over here uh, several years ago when the church first started. Right, we knocked on this guy's door, and he's saying all this garbage. And I'm like, all right, well, you know what? I'm out of here. We'll have a nice weekend, okay? And the person that I was with was, I think he loved Jesus. I think he's going to be in heaven with us. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? He doesn't believe any of this stuff. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, did you see the tear in his eye? I'm like, that was rage. That wasn't a tear. That was a bead of sweat because he wanted to hit me. Where's your discernment, man? Get real. <laughs> so, some people, man, they're around. I'm telling you. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing <laughs> by the word of God. No word of God, no salvation. No faith, no salvation. You know, somebody said, oh, I was, in, I was in a prison cell and I heard, I saw this beam of light and I heard these words and it was God saving me right there. Nope, not happening, not happening. That's not what our Bible says, verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went out, in, or I'm sorry, went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Look, don't listen to these people. And I've told you this before. Oh, not everybody has heard the gospel. No, what about the guy on the lost island? Okay, North Sentinel Island is the last island on this planet that has a group of people there that hasn't, quote unquote, been reached or touched. Well, I told you the story a few years ago. Some of you may not have heard it. There was a uh, Pentecostal missionary by the name of John Chow, and he decided it'd be a good idea to go travel to this island and try and get these people saved. And they shot him through the heart, I think, with an arrow. They, they killed him. Okay, so what does that mean? They don't want anything to do with us. They don't want anything to do with truth. They want to be left alone on the island, and they will die in their sins. But the fact of the matter is they have God's law written on their heart. The, look, someone taught them to hate. Something taught them to hate God. Look, that guy wasn't bringing the truth, but he was going to be saying things, you know, about the Bible, so to speak, and about our language, you know, at least giving them, you preaching Christ out of contention, if you will. And they wanted nothing to do with it. 
Okay, do you think those people are going to die and go to heaven? No, right? They know they have God's law written on their heart. They know that their behavior is reprobate. And I wouldn't recommend any of you really diving too deep into what they believe. I did for a sermon, and it's just, it, it's really bad. But we got to move on. I got to get off that. Look at verse 19. It says, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. We're going to stop right there. Go back to Hebrews, and we'll get moving here. So again, the point is here. Verse number, not verse 4, I'm sorry, verse number 2 of Hebrews chapter 4, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about the Word of God being profitable to humanity. It's profitable when you mix it with faith. But if you just hear it and you're like, eh, I don't know, I don't think that means that. I think I want it to mean what I want it to mean, which means when I go to church, I want to hear what I want to hear, meaning what my old man wants to hear. I want my ears tickled. Okay, I don't want to be paranoid. I don't want to be in fear. I don't want my sins being exposed. Too bad. That's Bible doctrine. We are all supposed to subject ourselves to this book, and this book will call you out. It will discern your thoughts, which is the title of the sermon this evening. Okay, So let's move on from that. Verse number three, he says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. Plain and simple. If you believe, if you are saved, you are in rest. You do not work for your salvation anymore. That ideology, that natural inclination to want to do something for salvation needs to go away. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Meaning this message has been the same from Genesis to Revelation. People love to throw out these different dispensations and all this garbage and say, well, back in the Old Testament, they had to follow the law and make sacrifices. If they did pretty good, they got saved. And then in the millennium, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to have to do sacrifices and follow the law, but it's going to be easier because the devil's going to be locked up. And so if you do that, you'll be able to be saved. No, false doctrine, okay? You're saved by faith. You enter into his rest. You cease from your own futile works. The sin debt has been paid. There's no way in the world that you can work for your salvation. It's impossible. Someone has already paid that bill. Verse 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. What's that a reference to? Genesis chapter 2, verse number 2. You're supposed to be able to read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and see the nature of God, that he would be the one to pay for your sin, that he rested from all of his works, that he ceased from his works. So when Christ, when God does something, when he builds something, when he sets something up, right, it is good. So when he breathes a new man inside of you, it's done, it's over, it's good. You can rest, you can bank on that promise. Verse 5 says, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Verse 6, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So again, the point is, now a lot of people out here, they don't enter into the most basic rest of salvation because they're caught up in works. They're caught up in human achievement. And look at what I can do for God, not what he did for me. Verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And his message to these Hebrew believers is the same message that we need to heed today. Hey, don't ever let a message that is biblically sound or a passage in the Bible harden your heart that way. Don't ever look at that like, oh, I can't believe the Bible says that. They expect me to do this. Oh, that preacher expects me to believe this, blah, blah, blah. No, if that's your attitude, look, man, you will suffer consequences. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. This book has warnings in there for that attitude. That's why he's referencing, hey, look at what happened to the children of Israel who didn't believe. They got destroyed every single time. Verse 8 says this, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, scholars love this verse here, and they're like, well, you know, you know that's the, the, Greek, the Greek term for the Hebrew name Joshua, and maybe it is, you know. It doesn't matter. Either way, it goes back to Jesus because he's the word. Right? He was the one looking out for Israel. He was the one looking out for Joshua. So it doesn't really matter. The point is it always points back to him. He's superior. He is who we worship and who we follow. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. 
So if you are the people of God, guess what? There remains a rest for you. So when you talk to people outside here and they talk to you and you can get the sense that they're not resting, they're not in rest, it keeps going back to works, to achievements, to what they've done or what they're doing or what they're going to do. Guess what? Hey, let them know you have not entered into his rest. Salvation is rest. We are at rest right now. I know some of these sermons, you're like, I don't feel like I'm resting. This is pretty crazy stuff here. This guy's crazy. It's still rest, okay? You're not going to hell. You, you're not. You, you don't. There's nothing you can do works-wise. You don't have to live in that fear. Like, man, did I do enough for God today? Did I really do enough? It, it, did he take away my salvation today? You know, can I, you know, if I sleep in tomorrow to a certain time and I don't, you know, get up, you know, can, can I maybe not sin as much? Doesn't matter, you know, we're, we're going to have problems in this life. He has paid that debt. It's wiped away as far as east is from the west. Verse 10, look what he says. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works and God, I'm sorry, as God did from his. So again, you're supposed to see how God sees from his works. You're like, oh, that's how this works. God separates that new man from the old man inside of you. We're going to get to that verse here in a moment. And it's a done deal. It's game over. Okay. He ceased from his own works. So again, most people that you talk to today that are quote unquote Christian, are, do they sound like they've ceased from their own works? Absolutely not. That Greg Lowry fool who came to Boise last weekend, Boise Harvest, Boise Harvest. Look, every house I go into practically, even these liberal Lutherans and stuff, these Episcopals, you know, these piss on a pole type people, you know what? <laughs> these people, look, they got this Greg Lowry, like it's super ecumenical. They all have Greg Lowry stickers on the refrigerators, on their dishwashers, Boise Harvest, you know? And it's like, that guy's a harvester of hell is what he is. I mean, you know, Pastor Thompson showed you that invitation that they were leaving around town on people's doors, right? And putting them in hotels. And they quote the NLT, the No Longer Truth Version. When you open that book, you are no longer reading truth. That's what I call it. And it says in there, I think it's uh, their version of Acts 3, 19, which basically says you need to repent of your sins so that you can get forgiven of your sins. Something to that effect. I'm not quoting it right because I don't want to memorize it. It's a, it's a joke. It's not true. It's like, okay, Christ died on the cross so that if you turn from all your sins, you can be forgiven. Then you'll have your sin debt paid for. Nope, that's blasphemy. Super blasphemy. But yet they went and populated Extra Mile Arena down there and had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people down there. Oh, oh, Greg Lowry, oh, Andy Mineo, oh. All these other guys, I forgot their names. I just know that guy because he wrote a book about why he supports trans people. And if you don't, you need to unfollow him. Good thing we didn't run into each other out on the street, boy, I tell you that. But might have to edit that out, Caden. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, everybody hops in the flesh once in a while. Verse 11, let us labor, therefore, into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. See, when I get myself worked up like that, am I in rest? No. <laughs> I step out of that rest. I'm like, hey, <laughs> what's going on here? Let's do something. Not good. See, so we do have to labor to constantly stay in that rest. Yeah, I was just giving you a, an example, okay? That's, that's what I was doing there. So enough of that. Paul's going to change gears, so to speak, here. But he's really on the same subject. Because, again, what's the whole point? Obviously, entering to rest. How do you enter into rest? Faith in works or faith in the Word, right? No, yeah, when people say, well, it's faith in works. No, 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 you got the W right. It's faith mixed with the Word, the Bible, believe the Bible, okay? Not works. It's like, are you a Greg Lowry disciple? Are you a Chuck Smithite? Because that guy was a crazy psychopath. You say, no, he wasn't. He was a loving man who owned a radio station. No, Chuck Smith believed both sides of every single controversy known to man, okay? I've got his book under here if you don't believe me. So let's move on here before I get upset and forget what I'm talking about. Verse 12. Very popular verse. I love this verse. It says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So very interesting, right, that he's going through the importance of the word of God and mixing it with faith. And when you do that, a person gets saved. They get born again into the kingdom of God. But after that, it's not over. You want to seek to live your life in that rest, no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on around you. And it all points back to the written word of God, which is Jesus Christ. And you're going to see that here in verse 12 and 13, okay? So he says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of, don't miss this, soul and spirit, right? Soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow 
and don't miss this, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We're going to talk about all that. Go to Psalm chapter 39. Psalm chapter number 39. <clears throat> so, again, anybody who says, well, you can get saved without the Word of God. That's a lie. That is not true. The Bible says right here very plainly that it is the Word of God that separates soul and spirit from the joints and marrow, right? Two and two. Soul and Spirit from joints and marrow. Okay, soul and spirit. Can you see those? No, because they're spiritual things. They're inside of us. Joints and marrow, you can see. The flesh, bone, right, bone marrow, you, those you can see. That, that is what the Word of God does. When a person mixes the preaching of the Bible with their measure of faith, what happens? And they say, I'm going to make Christ the object of my faith. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. And they call upon Him for salvation. What happens is this book, the Word of God, literally separates the soul and spirit from the joints and marrow. It separates what we call the new man, which is made up of soul and spirit, from the old man, which is the, the joints and marrow, which, you know, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. You guys know this. We've talked about that um, in past sermons. That is how powerful this book is. Now, can any other book out there do something like that? Absolutely not. Not going to happen. But it's this book that has that transformative power, okay? Now, We've spent a lot of time uh, the last several months kind of going and, and, and talking about that. You guys know that the Word of God is what saves. It's what literally transforms. I mean, the Word of God does things in the spiritual like, like no other book absolutely can. But the last part of Hebrews 4.12 there says this, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is what so many people today have a serious, serious issue with, what they have a big problem with. Like that verse there, Hebrews uh, 4.12, that really is just a quick verse to sum up the beginning of the new birth all the way to the end of the life of, of, of the Christian. Because what does it say? The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, right? It divides soul and spirit from the joints and marrow. So it separates new man from old man. So now you have this double nature thing going on, and Paul talks about that, right? But after that, it says, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So after you're saved, after you have the new man, after you're indwelled with the Holy Ghost, hey, the Bible's telling you, hey, this word, this book right here is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. So when you read this book or you come to church and they preach out of this book here, there is something that will offend every single person in here because last time I checked, we all are wearing the old man. Everybody in here has got the old man. And when people come in here, oh, I crucified him. No, you didn't. I'm looking at him right now. You're lying to me as you speak. You've never even been here before. You didn't even make it past that little sign right there, and you're already lying to me. You're already lying. You're worse than anybody in here. Okay? The Word of God will discern your thoughts and your, your intents. And you'll be sitting in that chair over there. Oh, who did I tell that to? I'm going to get them. You know, and you'll be racking your brain. Maybe I said this. Maybe I said that. And God's like, it's a spiritual book. I know what you're thinking. I know your thoughts. And I know your intents. You may try to cloak them. You may try to spin them. And we all do it. But he's up there like reading you like an open book. Look at Psalm 30, uh, 139, Psalm 139 in verse number one. So this is written by David. And he says this, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Now, does that only apply to David? No, this is the word of God here. This applies to everyone. God searches the hearts of men. He searches the minds of men. When this book is opened and preached, it searches the hearts and minds of men. This is why I'll get messages in the middle of the night saying, I hope you die a slow, painful death. You're scum. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Because I, we're just having church preaching the Word of God. And somebody in Washington, D.C. or someone in California or someone in Texas heard something I said out of the Bible and they don't like it. It pierces them so deep. <laughs> And they hate God so much that they feel the need to let me know. <laughs> Verse number two. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. I, I love mentioning this one. We don't, we may, you know, sometimes I think I'm pretty good at discerning, you know, what's going on with people. But sometimes I'm wrong. God's never wrong. He knows us. He knows your actions. He knows your thoughts. And the psalmist here, David, he's letting you know that. He says, thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. He knows from the minute you wake up to the minute you lie your head down on your pillow. He knows your intents. He knows everything you're going to do. He understands that. But he says he understands your thoughts afar off. 
Think about that. He knows the thoughts you're going to have tomorrow, five years from now, ten years from now, if the Lord allows you to live that long. Verse 3, Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Look, God, I don't have time to get into it, but God has definitely shown me the last six months that this is true. He knows my ways. As I tried doing my own thing with my career and my jobs, and he was like, you're coming right back where you started, and you're going to like it. You know what? And I like it. It's great. <laughs> He's acquainted with all my ways. I have seen this in my life, and hopefully you have too. If you haven't, you definitely will. But the point is, he knows his children. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to think. He knows what is the true intent of your actions and your decisions. Verse 4, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. So who's ever been in that position? I find myself in this position all the time where I want to say something, I want to describe something, I just don't have the word for it. Right? Well, he's got that word. That's how close he follows you. That's how close he knows you. He knows what that expression is. He knows what you're trying to say. Think about it. That's how deep he knows every single believer in the world who's ever lived or whoever will live. He knows the numbers on your, he knows the numbers of hair that are on your head. Think about that. If he knows how many hairs are on your head, he's going to know all of these things. And thank God we can't read each other's thoughts because, of course, we never talk to each other again. But <laughs> verse number five, thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. So he's reflecting on all the times that God has helped him and straightened him out. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Don't even try to think like and really understand. Like, how does God know how many? You know, that's what the scientists would do. That's what your BSU, you know, scientists would do. Oh, how do, if there is a God, how would he, you know, it's, shut up. Just believe it and move on. You're wasting your breath. You're wasting your time. You cannot attain to that. He is superior. He is above all of us. Verse 7 says this, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And so go back to Hebrews chapter 4, because we have to get moving. But the point is, there's nowhere where you can go to escape God. We saw that in Revelation. These people that say, oh, hell's just a separation from God. No, if you were to keep reading the Bible, you would see that, you know, if David says, hey, if I go up to heaven, behold, thou art there. If I were to descend down to hell, behold, thou art there. He's everywhere. He is everywhere. Think about this. He has an angel of the bottomless pit who somehow, some way, keeps order with terror. I mean, <laughs> look, he knows what's going on everywhere. There's nowhere to hide from God, okay? Now, Hebrews 4.12, one more time. Look what it says. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Right? D asunder, what does that mean? It means to cut in half. He divides it in half. He cuts that thing in half into the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What we need to understand is that our character matters, okay? People, oh, you don't like the Black Lives Matter organization? No, because they're not about lives. They're not about black lives. They're about queers and all these transies, or trannies, whatever they are, and freaks, these transistors, you know? <laughs> these trans that's what they're about, right? But what the Bible's about is character. Character matters. How you live your life for Christ matters. It matters on a deeper level than anyone in here can possibly realize. The decisions that we make throughout the week, they have spiritual ramifications because we are in a spiritual battle. And when we lie and do not the truth, when we become victims of our own self-deception, you know what happens? Little devils that are running around, they point that out and they tell the accuser and he goes up to God and says, hey, he's not what he said. Look what he did. He stood up for all the truth and he backs it. He flipped like a, like a pancake. He started waffling. You know what? God doesn't like that because now he has to do extra work and, and it's, just, it's just a mess. Okay, That's what he's saying here. Christian character matters. We need to understand that this book, this, you know, obviously it separates new man, old man gets you saved, but it also discerns your thoughts and the intents of your heart so that you can work on your character, not so that you could be paranoid and, oh, come to church, oh, you know. No, it's to have a healthy fear of God. It's to grow. It's to grow in the Lord. We need sermons about Christian character and how we act towards one another. And if you have a problem with that, it's because you're a prideful, arrogant human being and you don't know the truth and you don't understand the word of God. That's what that means. You can try to debate me all day long and you will lose every single time. Look at verse 13. 
So after, what, what are we talking about? Don't forget the context. Word of God. The Word of God, verse 12. Look what it says. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. When was the last time you read a secular book that was referred to as a person? Yeah, that's what I thought. This is the only book on the planet that is referred to as a person. Because the words that He speaks, they are truth, they are life. These are living words. These are words that engraft people when they mix it with faith. So neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. There is no human being. There is no character trait. There is no personality trait. There is no issue of life that cannot be uh, measured up against this book because he sees everything. He's seen it all. Look at the rest of the verse. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. And we're out of time. So, you know, I know it was a short chapter and you're like, yeah, we're going to knock another one out. But nope, we're going to have to stop right there. And we're going to pick that concept up next week and talk about the importance of character in the Bible. Character, lives matter. Okay. How you live your life for Christ, it matters to the people around you and it matters to Christ. And you know what? We should fear God. We're commanded to fear God. It's not even an option, okay? It's the paranoia thing, okay? That uh, We don't want to be paranoid, but we want to have a healthy fear of God, and we'll get into that next week, and we will talk about that. So let's stop right there for tonight. Bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for this word, for this book, Lord, that it's not like any other book in the world. I pray that we would never lose sight of that as a church. Lord, be with us as we fellowship, and bring us back safely on Wednesday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.